This is Google Translate, and ironically, it's actually ruining translation. It's slowly killing an entire industry of translators who have to constantly drop their rates to compete with this free service, and half the time it fails spectacularly anyway. Of course, the accessibility is great, but it also makes us take for granted just how much goes into good translation. Language isn't a barrier that needs breaking, like Barack Tarofsky, the creator of Google Translate, might have you believe. However, a lot of recent video games have showcased the power of learning a language and the magic of translation, and just how much nuance and context can go into understanding each other. The power of language in video games. Is it worth deciphering? or does it get lost in translation? Before we get into the video essay, I just wanted to jump in here and remind you to subscribe and like the video for more content like this every single month. It's free and really helps the channel grow. Thank you so much. Part of what made me want to create this video is that I've realized games which effectively make you feel like a foreigner in an unfamiliar environment feel really cathartic for me. I know. These are just video games, and maybe it's not even that deep, but when I first moved from Germany to the United States as a kid, I didn't speak any English. Everything was intimidating and new, and I couldn't communicate with anyone. There were no quest markers or tutorials. When you can't speak the language of the people around you, even among a crowd of people, you feel isolated. At this point, it's a pretty well-worn trope in video games. Your character wakes up in unfamiliar surroundings. They have no tools or weapons, no idea where they are or how they got there. A completely blank slate. But they're the one who's going to make it to the end of the game and defeat the final boss or rescue the princess or whatever. But there's a reason this formula never really feels stale. It's so effective as a video game trope because it perfectly mirrors us as the player booting up the game for the first time. It neatly lines up what's going on in the story and what's going on with the gameplay. Just like the protagonist we're controlling, we have no sense of what this world is or how it functions. But as we grow stronger and gain our footing, so too does our character. In these games, we often move from being outside observers to being active participants. Going from a complete fish out of water to the only person who can acquire the game's MacGuffin is a pretty satisfying journey. And really upping that feeling of being a foreigner in a new land is creating a language that both the player and the main character don't understand yet. It drives home the feeling of isolation even harder and makes the player curious to know more. Even in a game like Journey, which can match you up with another player to accompany you through a majority of the game, you still feel so isolated because of your lack of communication skills. Your only chance at speaking is through indecipherable chirps, and those aren't really all that effective. Or, you know, drawing a dick in the snow after they drew a heart because you thought they were an AI. Yeah, I definitely didn't do that live on stream or anything. He just drew a heart? <laughs> I'm so sorry, I didn't even see! That's so cute! So maybe that lack of communication is for the best. Journey and Abzu would be completely different games if they communicated with the player via direct language. That lack of explicit communication gives you the sense that you don't necessarily belong here that you're exploring uncharted territory, but there's enough visual information to give you a good sense of what could be going on here. Enough environmental storytelling to let you come to your own conclusions about your place in this world. Even though you can't completely read this hieroglyphic language, you can still get a sense of what's going on without it being spelled out for you. If these little robot buddies spoke to you and told you where to go, the sense of adventure and exploration would be completely gone. That's one of the, uh, many reasons the introduction of Navi in the Ocarina of Time was so maligned by a lot of Legend of Zelda fans. And a big reason that exploration in Breath of the Wild actually feels like true, undisturbed exploration. By the way, if you want to see a great video about the history of companions in Zelda games, check out Rasputin's video on the topic. Being thrust into a culture we can't connect with because we can't communicate with those around us is a great way to make us feel underpowered at the beginning of a game. That being said though, this trope isn't always utilized to its best potential. There's plenty of times where this isekai style story beat is used to justify a lack of explanation and an unearned sense of vagueness. 
instead of mystery and immersion, we're given an air of incompleteness. The last piece of the puzzle that really makes this trope hit home is making that language barrier one that you can eventually overcome. Not only having you fell giant beasts along your journey, but also learning how to communicate in this alien world. Because in a lot of ways, translation is the last real way to do mystery right in video games. Let me explain what I mean. This is the return of the Oberdin, one of the most critically acclaimed mystery games of all time. It's made by superstar solo developer Lucas Pope, and it won all of these awards upon its release. And I hated it. Okay, hate is a strong word, but I didn't feel it delivered on the promise of making me feel like I was doing much detective work or solving a mystery. It felt like I was playing a drawn-out game of Clue. It was Samuel Peter in the underway, crushed by cargo. And on, and on, and on. I felt like I was plugging numbers into an equation. The artwork is still really cool though, and I think you owe it to yourself to give this game a shot. And I don't think any of this is a knock on the game itself. Detective likes... Detective likes? Is that a thing? Mystery games kind of don't work most of the time. The gamification of adding up clues in your head to reach a conclusion almost never pays off in a satisfying way for me. Because in reality, synthesizing ideas like this in your brain is such an abstract idea and process, putting it in video game form is just inherently impossible. Most of the time it ends up being about picking up the right objects or finding specific clues in a specific order and then using them at certain predetermined moments. And if you're wrong, you can usually go back and try again until you've process of elimination your way to victory. It almost never actually feels like you've made a discovery yourself. But when a game asks you to translate an unknown language, it scratches the same itch that mystery games are going for without the tropes that make the genre feel a bit Clunky? That's right, Duolingo is the best mystery game of all time. I'm obviously joking, but the popularity of Duolingo and other language learning apps like it really just goes to show how much hunger we as humans have for learning new languages. It comes out of the inherent need we have to communicate as the social creatures that we are. And when that's turned into a game mechanic in a, you know, real video game, it feels wildly refreshing, especially when a developer has a slowly pieced together a game's conlang or constructed language. There's tons of conlangs in media that you're probably familiar with already. Klingon, Elvish, Dovazul. And when we translate them in game to reveal hidden information about the world, either for a gameplay benefit or just for some lore, we naturally feel like we're piecing together parts of a mystery for ourselves rather than just playing a game of pick the right item to put this man in jail. In Heaven's Vault, for example, we play as an archaeologist looking to learn more about her culture through deciphering the ancient language of her planet, coincidentally called Ancient. It nicely parallels our journey as the player as we're learning this language right alongside her. Each word that we translate to English becomes a clue that gives us a piece of a bigger picture. The language the developers came up with for the game is an English relex, making it not too complicated to decipher so you can get a sense of uncovering a mystery while not being stumped by every single word. An English relax, by the way, is a conlang that simply replaces English word by word. Round peg meets round hole. It's super neat and tidy with no grammatical changes to make things tougher on the player. Plus, it's easier on the creators, since it's a simple task of writing something in English and replacing it with some symbols. Skyrim's Dovazul, these wall scribbles, on the other hand, is actually a pretty in-depth conlang for a mainstream video game. Instead of each symbol being a direct stand-in for a familiar word, they all represent a sound, kind of like a letter in English might. And when put together, we get words that sound hefty and resonant. Grammatically, it's not all that different from English, but it does the job. At least it's not a letter-for-letter -letter based cipher language like Albed is in Final Fantasy X, which just feels like something you'd find on the back of a cereal box. 
When games are built around a player needing to translate a specific language to uncover important information, it's sort of impossible to make any of these conlangs very complex. If you did, you might end up with something like Sethian, a game whose alien language is so complex and removed from English in both grammar and vocabulary, you basically have to be a professional translator to even play it. Language is complex. And translation, when done correctly, is never one for one. Creating a brand new living and breathing language from scratch is lots of work. And making one that translates easily for the purposes of gameplay is another layer of difficulty. I mean, humans have struggled with language since we were unga chunga ing in loincloths and hunting and gathering. That's why when we get to learn bits of these foreign languages, we feel so rewarded. There's a built-in dopamine rush, even when it's a completely fabricated video game language. And because video games are such an interactive medium, you can have entire plots, mechanics, and systems centered around being unable to communicate with the world around you. Exploring the unknown or unknowable. Environmental storytelling being your only ways to grasp at anything familiar sometimes. All of these little details let you solve the mystery of an unknown world without any bland exposition. Connecting everything on your own on a corkboard with red string. From a purely practical perspective, relying on visual storytelling like this means that a game can communicate with any player, no matter what language they speak. It gives the game a chance to communicate and translate universally. This is why Tunic so immediately grabbed me when I played it this year. It relies mostly on visual language to explain itself. And to parrot a lot of reviewers, the manual brings back memories of trying to play an imported game with a Japanese manual that you can't even begin to translate on your own. Slowly deciphering the game's manual word by word lets you peek into this unnamed world's cracks and crevices, showing you bit by bit what's really going on here. This manual is a brilliant fusion of hidden tutorial and environmental storytelling. It's progression that's not tied to the upgrades you stumble across along the way, but your personal knowledge of the game. Some games drop you into unfamiliar surroundings and ask you to find your footing on your own. Maybe a short tutorial, but most of the bigger revelations are up to you to figure out. And making translation a core mechanic of the game makes it feel like the knowledge is the reward. So a game like Outer Wilds, where you're translating an ancient alien language, feels so rewarding because you can decipher the spiral messages all you want, but synthesizing that information those spirals give you is all up to you. And when you do, successfully finding answers to questions you've had since the beginning of the game, you feel like a space Sherlock Holmes. Like you've single-handedly solved an ancient extraterrestrial mystery. Because you kinda did. It's like that endorphin rush you get in Dark Souls when you find a shortcut that loops right back around to somewhere you've already been in a way you didn't expect. A secret path that was right under your nose all along. A revelation that changes the way you see the world you thought you knew like the back of your hand. These things were always here and never stashed behind any in-game keys or unlockables. You just didn't know about them yet. You're learning about the game world naturally. And these knowledge checks can only really happen once. You can't really unlearn any of these translations. That's why I'll always watch someone's first Outer Wilds playthrough on Twitch. That discovery through translation is an incredible thing to experience. I would go as far as to say that the discoveries in Outer Wilds only feel so monumental because they are in a foreign language from a long dead species. If the game delivered any of these revelations through NPCs dotted around the map rather than ancient texts that you discovered on your own, it wouldn't hit the same. This is why some of the most rewarding games I've played hide their tutorials in plain sight. It transforms the constant barrages of hey, listen. and text pop-ups into puzzles for you to solve. And when this is done well, each new piece of info is a revelation instead of a dry text box. The majority of games opt for the more straightforward tutorial, and understandably so. This type of hidden tutorial essentially trades off approachability for accomplishment. 
By not telling us everything about a game up front and hiding it behind knowledge checks like a foreign language, mechanically, instead of encouraging a player to grind a few levels for experience, the game is encouraging a player to get invested in the game's world. So where a game like Dark Souls or Skyrim has a lot of world building going on, there's never really an in-game reason for me to engage with that world building. I'm not going to stop every five minutes during gameplay to read a book or an item description on a ring that I just picked up. But in something like Tunic, the fact that the knowledge is so directly tied to my understanding of how to progress makes me hungry for that knowledge. So to illustrate this, here's a puzzle during the end game of Tunic. And here's me solving it. If you haven't played Tunic, then you have no idea what was going on there. And that's because this knowledge check builds on so many layers of context that previous knowledge checks in the game have given me. So was showing you that even a spoiler? It's just about as foreign as it could possibly get from the standpoint of someone who isn't fluent in the ways of Tunic's mysteries. And taking it back to the intro, imagine you were able to go to Google Translate and type in this game's conlang. All the answers to these puzzles would have been handed to you without any comprehension of the language's rules. That would rob you of any reward linked to earning this knowledge for yourself. Any kind of sense of accomplishment. Even though I've said time and time again on this channel, I'm not usually one that's pushed forward by intrinsic motivation in video games, but rather extrinsic motivation, I would argue that making progression tied to knowledge is the ultimate fusion of both extrinsic and intrinsic motivation. You're gaining insight into the world you inhabit, making you a better player, while the game is rewarding you for your progress with bits of that knowledge. Until you suddenly zoom out and feel yourself become fluent in the game's language. By the way, this is why video essay YouTube, me included, loves Metroidvanias so much. It's that same fusion of intrinsic and extrinsic motivation that rewards your progression through a game. The new moves you unlock are an extrinsic in-game reward for progressing, while learning to use it to get to new areas makes you feel like you're getting better as the player, intrinsically motivating you to want to learn more. Pretty genius game design when it's done right. This is the final boss of Sifu. And that's him kicking my ass. This game is tough as nails. Even on standard difficulty, it can feel like an impenetrable wall of a game. It really tests your reflexes and understanding of the mechanics, and I could not keep up at first. It felt like there was a language barrier between me and the game. So I switched over to easy mode to learn what this game was trying to tell me. I got familiar with each move, memorized enemy patterns and their counters. I was slowly learning and growing and getting more confident in my ability to respond to what the game was trying to say. It was like my own shonen anime training montage in real time. When you finally get down the rhythm and flow of the game mechanics, it feels like you're finally achieving fluency at a foreign language. And that's essentially what it is. When you think about it, video games teach you a new language every time you boot up a new title. The controls might be completely foreign to you, but you'll often get a tutorial before stumbling through the first few sections on your own. And before long, you'll be completely fluent in the language of gameplay. The buttons we press on the controller are like the words that we string together to construct a sentence. And the more we learn, the better we get at understanding the grammar. Before we know it, we're in the flow of a conversation with a game instead of just being talked at. Sifu does have a tutorial on all the basic controls and what the symbols mean. You're not completely left to your own devices. But it's like back in high school when we learned all the Spanish vocabulary for fruits and colors without knowing how to put them into a sentence. I know the words, but how do I use them to say anything? And one of the most effective ways to do that is through just trying and failing and trying again until you finally get it. This is the game's non-diegetic language, as in the language of the game that we, the player holding the controller, are attempting to speak through button inputs. The strength of a non-diegetic language's construction is just as important as that of a diegetic one, that being the language spoken in the game world, like the one we decipher in Tunic or Heaven's Vault. This is footage of my boyfriend playing Hades for the first time. 
the isometric angle, fast-paced action, and controls are fairly unfamiliar to him. You can tell he doesn't speak the game's language just yet. Now here's me playing the same section of the game after having put about a hundred hours into learning the game's language. There's an observable difference in fluency, obviously. Just like there would be if we were both trying to order something at a cafe in Berlin. There's a unique language in media that really only video games can use, and it's interaction. So when our sense of interactivity is no longer preceded by what button do I press in this situation? That's how we know we've become fluent in a specific game's non-diegetic language. Any attempt at communication we make is a form of translation. We're translating our emotions into words. We're translating body language into intention. We're translating tone into subtext. It's why one of the greatest hurdles that humans have historically faced has been effective communication. There are so many nuances to language that make it challenging to understand each other. And a lot of the games I mentioned take that concept and empower us by incentivizing us to jump over that hurdle. Deciphering foreign texts, becoming fluent in ancient tongues, and learning more about alien cultures. Games can use language itself as a tool to show us just how much we can grow through improving our capacity for communication. Unless you're a YouTube commenter who only watched half the video. Also, pay your translators a livable wage. So what's your favorite video game conlang? Let me know down in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please click the like button down below and subscribe to the channel. I put over 40 plus hours into these video essays every single month, so I would really appreciate your support. Doing that also helps the video get seen by more people and helps the channel grow. Speaking of helping out, these videos are not cheap to produce. So if you believe in the content and want to see me do this full time, you can always help me out with donations over on the Ko-fi page or becoming a monthly member over there. Like these lovely monthly supporters over here. Thank you so much to the Werewolf, Undies Marita, Oyster Milk, Deer Papaya, Mum Pow, Voxamandius, Puzzled Monkey Tree, Captain Danvers, Actual Folk Boy, and Veltwalker. For as little as $4 a month, you can help support and get shoutouts at the end of the videos here, access extra content, and get sneak peeks of upcoming video essays. Also, if you want to check out any of the video games that I mention in any of my video essays, always check the description down below. There's Humble Bundle affiliate links to there to every video game that I showcase. So if you want to try them out, I get a 5% kickback and some of that also goes to trans charities, which is amazing. It's a win, win, win. And sometimes they have sales that Steam doesn't have. So it's worth checking out. Anyway, thank you again for watching the video all the way through. I appreciate you and I'll see you in the next one. Oh yeah, go share the video. Thanks. <laughs>